guys, welcome to the Way of the Nerd. My name is Mindy and today we'll be looking at an analysis of two important books Forrest Fenn listed in the chapter of his memoir entitled Important Literature. Be sure to stay tuned till the end where I'll give my personal thoughts on the state of the chase. In high school literature class, the teacher gave us a very uh, forgettable assignment. We were to read The Great Gatsby and provide an analysis of the main characters. Even though I love to read and would joyously read almost anything for hours, The Great Gatsby was dusty to me, meaning old sounding, you know, like a scratchy shriek of a violin concerto on a wind up Victrola. But I tortured myself through it and as a consequence, I remembered nothing about it when I reached adulthood. But then I watched Leo DiCaprio's version of The Great Gatsby, put out by Warner Brothers in 2013, and I sort of enjoyed it in a philosophical and visual sort of way. It was almost surreal how the richly gilded characters glided from one room to another, as if they were light as cotton puffs. But you might be asking, how does this all tie into the chase, Mindy? Well, Forrest mentioned several books in the chapter of his memoir titled Important Literature. Two of those books were The Great Gatsby and The Catcher in the Rye. He wasn't impressed with Gatsby, but liked The Catcher in the Rye. The question we need to ask ourselves is why? Today we'll investigate five key comparisons and contrasts between the two classics and hopefully gain an understanding why one went into the trash while the other garnered his praise. And I think we will be able to see why Forrest chose to include both books in the chapter Important Literature. First, let me give a very short summary of The Great Gatsby for those of you who haven't read it. The Great Gatsby, written by F. Scott Fitzgerald, is narrated by Nick Carraway, a young graduate from Yale who moves to New York and ends up living next door to Jay Gatsby, an extravagantly wealthy man whose sole purpose in life is to win back the love of his pre-army girlfriend, Daisy, who is now married to an adulterous jerk and lives directly across the river from Gatsby. The book was acclaimed for its accurate depiction of the lifestyle of the wealthy during the 1920s. It also challenged the ideals associated with the American dream by suggesting that money and popularity are not all one needs to be happy. Now, in contrast, The Catcher in the Rye is a novel by J.D. Salinger. The novel follows two days in the life of 16-year-old Holden Caulfield after he's been expelled from school. Confused and disillusioned, Holden wanders around Manhattan, searching for truth and innocence. He constantly complains about the phoniness of the adult world, while at the same time admitting he's a phony himself. Number five, both books have narrators with polar opposite views of themselves. In The Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway says, I am one of the few honest people I have ever known. Holden Caulfield, the protagonist in The Catcher of the Rye, describes himself as the most terrific liar you ever saw. Throughout The Great Gatsby, Nick takes pains to paint himself in the most positive light he can, while Holden Caulfield is internally honest enough to admit his flaws if only to himself. Four, both books have protagonists who had unattainable dreams and held impossible ideals regarding time. While Gatsby wanted to go back in time when his relationship with Daisy was pure and true, Holden wanted to stop time altogether and prevent himself and other children from becoming a phony adult. That's why Holden loved the museum with its static displays. Nothing ever changed there. In the museum, time had stopped. Holden believed certain things should stay the way they are. You ought to be able to stick them in one of those big glass cases and just leave them alone. Gatsby, however, felt that if he could just go back to that glass case in time with Daisy and just start over, he could make it all right the second time around. Now remember, in the thrill of the chase, Gatsby, went into the trash right on top of the Time magazine. He also mentions that if any readers over the age of 12 don't see a little of themselves in this memoir, then maybe they deserve another turn. 
A few paragraphs later, he again mentions time when he writes that Eric Sloan never dated his paintings because he had a deep personal superstition that ignoring time itself might be a secret technique to delay aging. And now that I think about it, aren't photographs a way to stop time in a way? Photographs give us the opportunity to remember people who are no longer with us the way we want to remember them, full of life and opportunity. The thrill of the chase has many pictures of his loved ones in it, as Forrest says, in full blossom. Maybe that's another reason his memoir may be very important in discovering how to solve the poem. With 123 mentions of time, or its variations, in The Thrill of the Chase, it's obvious Forrest thinks about time and its mysteries often. But it's a little hard to determine just how he feels about it and what he would do with it if he had the chance. Would he stop time in the present? Go back and do more things than he's already done as he suggested in his book? Or would he do nothing, having accepted that time can't be manipulated by sheer force? Maybe the latter is illustrated by his comment on time being cyclical and tea with Olga. Time had taken them apart, but it eventually brought them back together. When Forrest was confined to bed with his own cancer diagnosis, he discovered just how badly he wanted more time. He says, Before, I had been happy with where my life was, but now what I seemed to lack in time remaining was conspicuously exceeded by my sudden desire for more of it. On the Splendid Heritage website, Forrest enigmatically says, For a wise man, who was actually the poet Henry Austin Dobson, once said, Time goes, you say. Nay, nay, alas, time stays, we go. 3. Both books feature an enchanted object. Enchanted objects are objects that are filled with an almost magical or purely magical energy and serve a specific purpose. Enchanted objects are fairly common in literature, and some examples might be the magic beans and Jack and the Beanstalk, Holden Caulfield's red hunting cap, or the distant blinking green light at the end of Daisy's dock on the other side of the river. Holden's red hunting cap provided protection against the harsh adult world. In one of the last scenes of the novel, Holden had just shared an intensely emotional and happy experience with his little sister Phoebe. Phoebe then places the hunting cap on Holden's head, and that simple gesture was of great importance. It's the moment when someone finally empathizes, I can't say that word too good, can I? with Holden and accepts him just the way he was. In Gatsby's case, it's a little disconcerting to observe Gatsby stretch out his arm as if to reach for the mystical green light and fail to reach it night after night. Yet Gatsby never gave up. Everything Gatsby does serves one purpose, to win Daisy. And in the end, despite his eternal hope and manic endeavor, Gatsby still fails to achieve the dream. That dashed hope could be one reason why Gatsby went into forest trash. Nick Carraway described Gatsby with a compliment rarely applied to the filthy rich. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life. Gatsby had an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person, in which it is not likely I shall ever find again. 2. Both novels were a reflection on phoniness. In fact, both of the protagonists, Holden Caulfield and Jay Gatsby, are phonies in their own way. Holden Caulfield's phoniness is demonstrated when he introduces himself with a fake name, lies about his age to get alcohol, and tells people false stories about his past. His phoniness seems to be a kind of coping mechanism for dealing with his brother's death. Jay Gatsby, on the other hand, became one of the phony adults Holden despised. Gatsby gained his wealth illegally and for only one purpose, to win Daisy. While Holden claimed all girls were dumb, Gatsby lived his entire adult life trying to win the love of just one. One, 
Both characters were denied of saying a last goodbye to the one they loved most. Holden's brother, Ali, died of leukemia. Holden was 13 at the time and Ali was just 11. When Ali died, Holden lost it, smashing out windows with his bare hands. As a result, his parents took him to the hospital for treatment of his physical and mental wounds, and he missed Allie's funeral. He didn't have a chance to say his final goodbye to his brother. In one of the final scenes of the 2013 Gatsby movie, Gatsby decides to swim in his pool for the first time ever while waiting for Daisy to call him on the telephone. He is certain she will call, and the highly symbolic telephone is out of his earshot for just a couple of moments as he dives under the water. As he breaks the surface, the telephone rings. His eyes widen as the butler answers. It's Daisy! The moment he had been preparing and waiting for for five years had finally come. As he starts up the ladder to take the call from the woman who literally owns his soul, a gunshot rings out. The husband of Tom Buchanan's mistress, who Daisy killed with Gatsby's car, has shot Gatsby, and the wound is fatal. Which brings me to the realization that maybe Forrest didn't like the book because Gatsby didn't get any chance to say goodbye. Holden was at least in the house when his brother died, but Gatsby and Daisy left so much unsaid. When I first began communicating with Forrest several years ago, I sent him some samples of poetry I'd written over the years. There was one very short, simple poem that he was particularly struck by. Two red balloons together, soaring brightly in the sky, one popped and spiraled down and forgot to say goodbye. The poem symbolized a death you didn't see coming and was a reminder to never take life for granted. Every day bears the risk of being your last. It reminds me of the passing of Forrest's best friend, Eric Sloan. Eric's sudden rendezvous with death wasn't on the schedule that day, and death sometimes doesn't allow time for goodbyes. Tell your loved ones you love them every time they leave your sight. Be kind to everyone. Everyone has an internal struggle, and even the best psychiatrists in the world can't work out all the unique experiences of every unique person to accurately determine why someone is the way they are. We are all unique. We are all human. Like Gatsby, we can't turn back time for another chance. And like Holden Caulfield, we can't stop time to prevent the inevitable future. But we can take the time to make someone smile, to touch someone, even if it's over the cool handle of a telephone. Maybe it's time to give each other a break. Maybe it's time to recognize no one is perfect, especially the one staring back at us from the mirror. Maybe it's time to start practicing kindness, whether we feel it's deserved or not. Who are we really to judge who deserves kindness, mercy, and grace? So to summarize, I believe Forrest mentioned these highly symbolic books in his chapter titled Important Literature for a Reason, because they are important to solve the poem in some way. Maybe it's because of the symbolism I've described in this video, or maybe it's important because it's symbolic in other ways, such as the colors Fitzgerald used in the descriptions at various times in his book. That symbolism deserves its own video, and I'll definitely make this a two-parter. There are even more comparisons and contrasts that may be important, and I'll try to address those in the second part of the video, too. In the end, maybe it's as simple as Forrest just trying to get us to realize that the blinking green light, which symbolized hope, may not be as elusive for us as it was for Gatsby, and that like Gatsby, we should never give up reaching for it. Thanks for watching my video, guys. I'll see you next time on The Way of the Nerd. Remember, be kind to everybody and stay curious.